And we have breaking news now. Pete Williams in the newsroom. Pete? Okay, uh, Andrea, the charges have been unsealed against uh, Johar Sarniev for the uh, marathon bombing on Monday. He's accused of two uh, charges at this point. A terrorism charge, use of a weapon of mass destruction, and we've been explaining that's a term of art in federal law. It doesn't mean in the conventional sense of uh, talking about nuclear or biological weapons. It means any bomb that could injure people. And the other is malicious destruction of property resulting in death. That's a separate uh, explosives charge in the federal code. And uh, what this does mean is that uh, it's, the government could seek the death penalty based on this charge. And that's an interesting point because the state of Massachusetts does not have the death penalty. So the, uh, it's only in the federal system that the death penalty could be obtained. And what I've seen so far in looking through the documents here is a, a very detailed account of what we had been told was the key piece of evidence that got the FBI onto him in the first place, what he can be seen doing on a surveillance camera tape. And with your permission, Andrea, I just want to Please. quote from this document as it describes the tape. And, and it refers to uh, him, as, uh, the suspect here, as Bomber 2. Remember, they were showing two suspects, the one with the white hat who placed the second device, they say. They say about 30 seconds before the first explosion, he lifts his phone to his ear as if speaking on his cell phone and keeps it there for about 18 seconds. A few seconds after he finishes the call, the large crowd of people around him can be seen reacting to the first explosion. Virtually every head turns toward the finish line and stares in that direction in apparent bewilderment and alarm. Bomber 2, virtually alone among the individuals in front of the restaurant, appears calm. He glances to the east and then calmly but rapidly begins moving to the west, away from the direction of the finish line. He walks away without his knapsack, having left it on the ground where he had been standing. About 10 seconds later, an explosion occurs in the location where bomber number two had placed his knapsack. So uh, these, that's what I've seen in the charges so far, Andrea. Well, we'll keep coming back to you, of course, on MSNBC, Pete, as you go through the charges. But it's very clear from that that they have visual evidence, and it makes uh, the whole issue of Mirandizing him or not, and uh, whether his statements or any kind of confession have to be challenged or not challenged, kind of irrelevant or less well, relevant, they, since they, well, have, they, they have visual they evidence. Certainly have, they certainly have a lot of forensic evidence in this case, including, you may recall, the statement I haven't gotten through to see if it's in here, but the statement of, a, well, of one of the men who was most severely injured in the bombing, um, who gave a, a, a description. Pete. I'm just looking through the documents here. Oh, here's another point, Andrea. Uh, you may recall that they say that uh, during the shootout in uh, Watertown, authorities had said that a uh, pressure cooker device similar to the Boston Marathon device had been thrown from the car. Well, this is what the charging document says about that. It says a preliminary examination of the explosive devices that were discovered at the scene of the shootout in Watertown and in the abandoned vehicle, this is a car that they had that they abandoned, has revealed similarities to the explosive used at the Boston Marathon. The remnants of at least one of the exploded bombs at the scene of the shootout indicates that a low-grade explosive had been contained in a pressure cooker, the same brand as the one used in the marathon explosions. The explosive in Watertown also contained metallic BBs coated, uh, contained within an adhesive material as well as a green-colored hobby fuse. Uh, so uh, that's another uh, potential connection, they say. So these, as, as I just scanned this quickly, this seems to be the, uh, the two key points. Thank you very much, Pete Williams. Uh, as you continue to read, please interrupt us at any moment uh, with any new information that you have well, from I just, the complaint. I just see, and, and I'm going yeah, to do it myself, too. I just see one other thing here. They refer to the carjacking uh, and the victim who, uh, whose car was stolen. They say that uh, he was forced to drive uh, where they picked up a second man. So uh, it, it seems clear now from this that one of the two suspects as the, is, was the carjacker. They then pick up the brother, and they say they put something in the trunk. Um, they demanded money. They, we knew that they had used his ATM debit card three times. Um, then they say the gunfight ensued. 
so th- as I say, these these seem to be the same, uh, the, the main two points that are in this. And we, we should say uh, that these sta- these charges at this stage are very preliminary. They're, in essence, kind of holding documents that get the legal process started. But the government certainly will come back with a lot more detail in uh, when they, the, the next step will be to file a, a grand jury indictment because the federal constitution requires that anybody who's prosecuted as a, under a felony has to be indicted by a grand jury. So that's the next step. And that grand jury indictment undoubtedly will say a lot more. And then even before they get to the trial point, if it ever comes to that, uh, they can keep issuing uh, superseding indictments as they add more information and potentially more charges, Andrea. Thank you very much. The detail here tells us exactly why it took several days to come up with the charging document. Thank you, Pete. You bet.